Hello everyone and welcome to part one of chapter six, the lecture on wisdom and right view or stream entry in the context of the lecture series, True Dhamma, following in the footsteps of the Buddha. My name is Dr. Florian Lau from the Dhamma Hub and today I'm going to present the first steps of the hardwood of the Dhamma. Without this lecture, there is no Dhamma. Dhamma starts with right view, as the Buddha put it. Before that, everything is basically virtual. And if you are a true practitioner that wants to attain stream entry, then there is probably a lot of merit in following and uh, trying to understand this lecture. And uh, given that you already fulfill the preconditions, uh, it should be no difficulty to actually attain the right view, even while just listening to such a talk. But anyway, let us begin with a short overview over the content of the lecture that I'm going to present today. I will just explain everything to you, even though we might just be able to finish about a third or a fourth of the entire lecture, as this one is rather long. I will try to explain the Dhamma in many ways, so that it appears or appeals to many different people. The words we use as we learned in chapter 4 are very different, and the way we understand things is also very different. So it might be very beneficial to tackle the entire topic from multiple angles so that we can understand it properly. And the first thing that we must understand is what knowledge actually is in the context of the Buddha, or what knowledge actually means, what direct knowledge means. And then, uh, based on that, we will have another story time where we introduce uh, very important people in the context of the Buddha. We go through Anathapindika, uh, a person who gifted an entire park to the Buddha, where he spent a lot of time. Then there is uh, another part on the foundation of the Order of Nuns and some other minor aspects when it comes to the middle period of uh, the Buddha's well, lifetime pretty much, and a teaching career, if you want to put it like that. Then we will go through the most popular phrasing of the understanding of the Dhamma, namely the Four Noble Truths, but this time in detail. We go through each of them one by one and explain a bit what the Buddha meant by them. And then uh, concerning the last one, namely the Four Noble Truths, is a path leading to the cessation of suffering, uh, which is the Noble Eightfold Path, we will have that in more detail as that is the gradual training that brings us from the right view to full liberation of mind, which is what the Buddha mainly taught. So again, about 80% of all suttas uh, concern that, well, aspect of the training. There is a lot of virtue too, but uh, I guess the majority of uh, the suttas concern themselves with speeding up the progress of people who already understood the Dhamma. Then we discuss uh, very important insights on the path, uh, that might not be too much in line with what the Buddha actually taught, but which are of uh, benefit nonetheless. And then we come to the absolute heartwood of the Dhamma, the principle of dependent origination. Uh, without the understanding of that principle, there is no Dhamma. This is what the right view is, the understanding of the principle of dependent origination, and thus the acquiring of the tool to actually uproot your suffering for good. With the right view, you can uproot suffering so that it cannot arise again. Without the right view, you can only weaken it, but it will <clears throat> arise again in the future, which is very important to keep in mind. This is why the practice is so misunderstood, because both aspects, the mundane aspect and the supramundane aspects, uh, concern themselves with craving. So we weaken it, and it's very hard to distinguish weakening from uprooting, because in both cases, it is not really there anymore, at least for a time. And if you are very thorough in your weakening, then it will not be there for a very long time, as we has already, have already seen in prior lectures, where you can be free from craving for 60,000 eons, as an example, as a person who has uh, pretty much uprooted and uh, the, the body, who is liberated from the body, who has attained very high jhanas, as an example. Based on that, we try to understand what contemplation in itself is and why the Buddha was very, very keen on teaching uh, contemplation and why it was maybe the main method that he was teaching at that time. And then we have another section on the right view, on the attaining of the right view and explain in detail what it is, what it feels like, what the marks and characteristics of it are and why it is so misunderstood nowadays. And people misinterpret the right view in many different ways. And then we have a, a section on transcending methods and why you are no longer bound to following, let's say, mechanical instructions after the right view. You no longer have to 
let's say, formally meditate. And you will understand why, and I will try to explain why it is like that. And then in section 10, we go through several myths of stream entry that are very popular nowadays. As an example, many people nowadays think that stream entry is a minor event, where there's just a blinking out of consciousness, an event that you could even miss and not even know that you are a stream enterer. There are academias in Southeastern Asia that hand out stream entry certificates based on such an event. And there are a lot of methods out there that try to induce such a blinking out of consciousness event. Nonetheless, none of those events give you the means to find a way out of suffering. They are absolutely not what the Buddha talked about. And this is very important to understand. And then lastly, in section 11, we have a short summary. Okay, but enough for the overview. Let us now begin with the actual content. And as always, we like to begin the lecture or the first part of each lecture with five minutes of mindfulness. I invite you to do that, to pause the video for five minutes and train yourself in emotional non-reactivity. Whenever there is a feeling arising in your experience and pressures you to do something, Try to resist that urge, that urge that arises in relation to that feeling, and instead just treat it with indifference for five minutes. In that way, you weaken the grip of your own feelings and emotions on you, and thus gain a bit more clarity and weaken your craving. And I will now pause for a moment so that you can pause the video, and then afterwards I will assume that you are done with the five minutes of mindfulness. Okay, I assume that you are now done and we will now continue with the content of the lecture. And the first section is actually on knowledge and I want to give you at least a good intuitive understanding on what knowledge is and why knowledge is so powerful and meaningful in the Buddhist context. And famous uh, monk Ajahn Chah compared knowledge in one way with a basket of fruit. Not knowing what is in your basket of fruit, you have to repeatedly grab all the fruit out of the basket, put them on the ground and count them as an example. When you know with certainty what is in the basket, then you don't have to count anymore. Then you don't have to get all the fruit and line them up neatly and count them one by one. Then you just know what is in there. And doubt can be compared with frequently counting. So as long as you have to count, let's say, or meditate to ensure that you are free from suffering, then you are not really free from suffering. The freedom from suffering, the liberation of mind, starts with the absolute certainty that, well, you are basically free and that you know what you must do, that you have the knowledge of what must be done to overcome suffering. And understanding the Dhamma means that you don't have to go through any meditation motions anymore. You just know what must be done. You understand wholesome and unwholesome, kusala and akusala. But we will go through that in much more detail in the section on the right view. And understanding the Dhamma, and this is very important, means understanding the principle of dependent origination, which is the hardwood of the practice. The Buddha said that this is the teaching that is special to the Buddhas. You can weaken craving in other teachings, as an example, but you cannot uproot craving without instructions of another, without instructions of a Buddha. The Buddha is the person who basically did the impossible and discovered that principle all on his own. You could, to give you a mundane uh, comparison, uh, compare the entire process uh, with Einstein discovering his famous uh, theory of relativity or something like that. The first person who does it is an absolute genius who is incomparable to others. Other people can afterwards also rediscover it in different ways, which makes sense because they already know that it is possible and they already know what must be done in a sense. So the first one is an absolutely true genius. Without that person, it would be very difficult to, to even have well, <laughs> that knowledge available. But after one person does it and starts teaching it to other people, then it becomes much, much easier. This is also a phenomenon that we can observe in science all the time. As soon as one person proves something, there are spawning proofs, very difficult mathematical proofs everywhere. So that one person does the groundwork and then everyone can benefit from that. But yeah, in summary, once you know that 2 plus 2 is 4, you don't have to go through the motions or the training of adding numbers anymore as an example. You can just do it whenever you wish and that is the goal. You don't want to actively think about those things anymore. You want to have it available on an intuitive level so that you don't have to contemplate in certain ways, that you just know that things are impermanent, as an example. And I also like to compare the uh, look and feel of insight with this image. 
I could, for example, explain to you that ducks are looking like they are wearing dog masks. And just explaining this to you won't have the same effect as if I would present to you such a picture. And this is a very different, different experience. Now you know on an intuitive gut feeling level what I mean. And whenever you look at a duck, you will probably realize, oh, they look like they are wearing small dog masks instead of beaks. So this is a difference between knowing and knowing and seeing. This is obviously a very mundane example, but it should convey the point that there is a difference between those two things. And when the Buddha talked about insights in the context of the Dhamma, then he always talked about knowing and seeing, namely that gut, te- uh, gut feeling type of knowledge that I just discussed. And you can compare the process of understanding uh, with a fruit basket in another way that I came up with to give you a small exercise that you can do. Again, the top part between the two paragraphs, uh, above the, the paragraph, is what you should immediately do. Then you should pause the video for a moment and ponder, and then you should do the second part. And again, it's a really good idea to really pause the video and ponder, otherwise we have a tendency to self-cheat. But yeah, to understand the process of understanding, imagine looking at a basket of exotic fruits that are mainly unknown to you. To your unprepared mind, it is just a heap of strange shapes. You could start reading an encyclopedia or ask an experienced gardener to recognize the different kinds of shapes. And you first have to educate yourself to gain a rough understanding on what is in there. Would you then be able to, to tell what is in there, to tell all the fruits apart? Well, you can, can think about it. Maybe after <laughs> the, the encyclopedia or the gardener. But yeah. But after you have educated yourself in that way, you can look at the basket again. And this time it is suddenly possible to recognize bananas as bananas, pineapples as pineapples, and mangoes as mangoes. And the Buddhist nun Ayakema, as an example, described insights as a recognized experience. And it is practically impossible to just happen without doing the proper prior training. So if you want to recognize what the Buddha talked about in your experience, namely impermanence, You first have to inform yourself on impermanence, as an example, or on non-self. Only once you have outlined the rough characteristics of what the Buddha was talking about, will you be able to recognize it in your own experience. It is absolutely impossible to just stumble upon it. And even if you stumble upon an experience, it is not the having of an experience that is important. It is the understanding of an experience that sets you free. People can have experiences of anicca, of impermanence, of all those things, but only the complete understanding in the nature of things of impermanence will set you free, will liberate your mind or your body as an example. And this is very important because people always talk about mystical experiences. And again, it's not about mystical experiences. It is about understanding your experiences that you have. And they can also be mystical. If you understand mystical experiences as impermanent, then you will also benefit if you understand the nature of those things. And again, the nature transcends the content. It doesn't matter what kind of experience you have. It is about what all those experiences have in common. But let us now continue. Again, I'm not sure how long it will take. This is a rather long slide set, as it is a very important topic. And now we will come to a very important aspect of knowledge when it comes to humans. We are born with an implicit assumption about reality, or with implicit assumptions about reality, that are completely unknown to us. They are more or less our evolutionary programming. We are born with a tendency to acquire those views. That does not mean that they cannot be undone, but when nothing changes, nothing drastically changes, like a Buddha comes along and teaches us uh, in a different way, then those views will automatically emerge. So basically everyone on earth starts with a set of views that are akin to that. And one of those views is the self-view. Some of those views are very beneficial for survival of the physical body, as an example, but they are nonetheless wrong in certain cases. So we should always keep that in mind. Just because something is always there does not mean that it is right. And we don't know that those views are there, yet they cause us immense suffering. It is like walking through quicksand all our lives without really noticing. And the self-view, as an example, works on the, let's let's compare it with the level of significance of gravity. When the self-view vanishes, it is like gravity stops. (laughs) So uh, it's on that level of significance. It's like a lightning strike hits you or something like that. So it's a very distinguishable experience that is impossible to miss. And it is like learning you did something as fundamental as breathing wrong all your life. There are many ways that you can compare it with. And yeah, 
what is also very important is, as the Buddha said, that wrong views are more or less beginningless. They have always been there uh, concerning the circle of rebirth, so the, the wheel of samsara more or less. But even in this life, there is no first point where things went wrong. It is simply our biological programming. You can uh, intuitively explain it to you like that. The Buddha was not talking in terms of uh, evolution, but I think it is very beneficial nowadays to talk in, in those words as they are kind of relatable and as they help you understand the topic. But yeah, in essence, it is like being caught in a web where you cannot really find the first shred that could disentangle the entire web, like a spider web. The Buddha compared it with that. And wisdom means that you try to disentangle this entire web of wrong views and wrong knowledge, and you try to undo the self-view that is there, but which is absolutely not necessary. It is there gratuitously. But yeah, let us now continue. And this is a very important citation uh, that I think happened pretty much directly after the Buddha's attainment of uh, liberation of mind, namely after he has discovered Nibbana and was able to dwell in Nibbana. And he said, this Dhamma that I have attained is profound, hard to see and hard to understand. This is also very important, but I will explain it uh, in a moment. Peaceful and sublime, unattainable by mere reasoning, very important, subtle to be experienced by the wise. But this generation delights in attachment, takes delight in attachment, rejoices in attachment. It is hard for such a generation to see this truth, namely specific conditionality, dependent origination. And it is hard to see this truth, namely the stilling of all formations or sankharas, the relinquishment of all acquisitions, the destruction of craving, dispassion, cessation, nibbana. And again, most people just read over such a statement without giving it a second thought. Yet it is absolutely loaded with information about the Dhamma. This statement pretty much contained the entirety of the Dhamma and all the problems that were prevalent at that time. The first thing is that his teaching is hard to see and hard to understand. Many people nowadays proclaim that any kind of meditation is right, that you just have to meditate and then everything is okay. This might be true for the calming kind of meditations, but it is definitely not true when it comes to liberation or a complete transformation of your experience. It is a peaceful state, it is a sublime state, and it is unattainable by mere reasoning. You cannot intellectually think yourself to Nibbana. As I said before, it is a, a recognized experience, an experiential understanding, something that happens on the level of gut feeling. Your chitta, your feeling, your mood is liberated. It is not your mano, your thinking, intellectual mind that is liberated. The mind is not really the problem, the mano part, the intellectual part that reasons and thinks. The part that is a problem is the part that feels all the suffering. And when that part is liberated, then you are truly free. And it is a lightness, a peace that sets in. And the Buddha also recognized that this generation, namely his generation, already delighted in attachment. They delighted in owning things. They delighted in views and all those other things. And as they did for a very long time, it is very hard for them to let go of that attachment. And it's very hard for such a generation to feel the truth. And it is even worse nowadays, by the way. Because nowadays, people are even more used to all kinds of sensual pleasures and to all kinds of attachments. Because the longer you engage in sensuality, the longer you engage in instant gratification, the harder it will be to relinquish that kind of pleasure because you have gotten so used to it. And then, then the Buddha talks on and says that the truth is essentially specific conditionality or dependent origination. And this is the core of the Dhamma. This is the right view part of the entire uh, yeah, teaching. This is the hard word of the training. Specific conditionality means that parts of your experience right now depend uh, logically, but not temporally, on other parts of your experience. Namely, as an example, that craving fully depends on the presence of a feeling that is either good, bad, or neutral, that hedonic kind of feeling. And this is what the Buddha meant. Those things that depend on each other. And dependent origination means that one thing cannot be there without the other. So when you recognize that one of those things, namely the first thing, the Sankara part, fully determines the Dhamma part. <laughs> uh, sankara means uh, you could translate it as determination or cause, and Dhamma a thing. Then you recognize that all the Dhammas, and which includes ourselves, depend on Sankaras that are beyond our control because we cannot control our feeling, yet our entire sense of self relies on it. Once we see that, 
the impossibility of of a self to exist then we automatically let go and are released from that kind of, of bondage once we see that and what the buddha said then and it is hard to see the truth namely the stilling of all formations or all sankharas and you could translate that as a stilling of all activities of all things that feel like doing which is a pragmatic translation in my opinion and this is a very hard state to, to achieve the relinquishing of all acquisitions like letting go of all of the for me part of experience which is also a good way of explaining it the destruction of craving the you, you no longer want your experience to be any different you will grow dispassionate towards your experience and that experience of cessation of self is what nirvana is in this very life so this statement is loaded with information and it's one of the best summaries of the dhamma in my opinion you can read it up in full in majima nikaya 36 by scanning the qr code here it probably links you to the website Sutta central i always forget there are a few websites that collect teachings of the buddha but anyway let us now continue the dhamma and this is very important transcends virtue wisdom is not mere virtue it is not just weakening of craving it is a complete destruction of craving and here is a small reminder virtue means that there is the temporary abs absence or the temporary suppression of unwholesome or bad states of mind and wisdom means that there is an impossibility for the future arising of suffering or unwholesome states of mind Virtue means emulating the principle of Dhamma, and insight or Dhamma means that there is a real understanding, a real uprooting of the fundamental underlying causes. And wisdom or Dhamma transcend virtue. And the first of the ten fetters, as an example, is virtue and duty. It is translated as, uh, well, rites and rituals oftentimes, but as you can see, it even contains the word sila. Sila Bata Paramasa. It's not just uh, meaningless uh, ceremonies and rites. It is the attachment to certain observances, to certain duties, to certain motions in meditation, as an example. As long as you are attached to your meditation method, you have not fully overcome the fetter of a virtue and duty, which is also very important. And overcoming the mechanical part of meditation and emulation and mimicking is when Dhamma starts. But now a very important disclaimer before we begin with the uh, first story time and then the Four Noble Truths. Insight is very serious business. If you miss a solid foundation in virtue, they can be hard to handle. And only really proceed with caution and a skilled teacher and the firm knowledge that you are uh, essentially a good person that has well-trained emotional non-reactivity. So that the understanding of the Dhamma will really set you free and not startle you because it can be at times difficult to stomach when you miss certain preconditions practice what i present here at your own risk which is very important and i think that is one of the reasons why so few books talk about the understanding of dhamma actually there are two reasons because first of all many people have not seen the dhamma yet and mistake other meditative experiences with dhamma and the second reason is that it might be uh, too difficult to handle for some people and they don't want to expose unprepared people to such knowledge but again it is at your own risk so <laughs> please uh, keep that in mind but now to the next story time story time number six where we talk a little bit about anatta pindika and the foundation of the order of nuns so first of all who was anatta pindika anatta pindika uh, can also be translated as the feeder of the unprotected and after the first or two rains retreats he encountered the buddha he had a vision of terror and then he went out and uh, knew that there was a person who can help with that and he uh, received certain teachings from the buddha and in the end he attained stream entry he was a very wealthy merchant and immediately offered a park and a monastery to the buddha and to the sangha that they could dwell in that had basically the perfect conditions for the buddha and large group of monks it was close enough to a large city so that they could get their arms food and survive and it was big enough and secluded enough that the people who were living there could dwell in seclusion or near seclusion so that they can actually progress when it comes to the teaching of the buddha which requires a certain degree of seclusion it also requires teachings and the presence of a sangha but also seclusion and the buddha spent many rains there if not basically most of the rain retreats and the rain is just the monsoon time where in india it is raining a lot and you can't really travel 
And if you travel, you pretty much destroy all the fields of the of the farmers that are living there. And that was criticized very much. So the Buddha decided that during that time there is no wandering allowed, and they spend pretty much all the time in one place. And yeah, it was a pretty perfect dwelling place for large sanghas. And uh, Ananda Pindika in the end died a stream enderer and made much merit in this life. And in the end, on his deathbed, he has been taught by Ananda and Sariputta, who uh, gave him very detailed uh, instructions that uh, uh, led to him crying even out of happiness, pretty much. He also complained a bit that he only then received such teachings. But yeah, he was a very busy person, so he was not always seeking the teachings of uh, monks like uh, Ananda, Sariputta and the Buddha himself. And then uh, there is also the formation of the Order of Nuns. And this took place at the fifth rain retreat, so about five years after the enlightenment of the Buddha. And shortly before, a uh, lay king became an arahant on the uh, deathbed, which is, which is also uh, interesting. Because people always think that it's impossible as a lay person to become an arahant. There is a myth going around that you die within seven days or you, that you become a monk. But that is not true for all I can tell. <laughs> you can be a lay arahant, but you cannot live like a lay person anymore. Nowadays, since uh, it is hard to find sanghas that practice the true Dhamma, there might actually be more, <laughs> more hidden lay arahants around than uh, arahants in the context of monasteries. Even Ajahn Shah said that if there is a monastery with three sincere practitioners, which might be stream enterers, it is thriving. Most of the other monks are just there for, I don't know, what they try to attain. But they most of the time do not take the teaching very serious. And he even said that you are wasting your time if you are not a stream enterer after five years of being a monk. And there are a lot of people of that kind uh, around nowadays. And the Buddha uh, started to visit his native city and he met his foster mother, Gotami, as his uh, real mother died on the deathbed. Uh, not on the deathbed, <laughs> or while giving birth to the Buddha or directly after. And she wanted to be ordained, but she was refused, because at that time it was not allowed for females to become uh, pretty much wandering philosophers of any kind. And later that, uh, during that time period, Ananda, the personal attendant of the Buddha, convinced the Buddha to allow females to also practice towards liberation. He asked the Buddha if it would be possible for females to attain stream entry, uh, once return and non-return and arahanship and the Buddha always said yes, yes, yes. And then they decided, okay, we make it possible for, for females to become ascetics, to become truth seekers, to become nuns essentially, but there will be some additional rules. And now you can debate why those additional rules were necessary. But uh, in my opinion, and please keep in mind this is just my opinion, uh, those type of additional rules protect the newly allowed female practitioners from criticism from the outside. If you just allow them on the same footing, then people would be outraged because at this time that was a rather revolutionary <laughs> statement. There were not many female wanderers and they were not treated very well. So yeah, this is important to keep in mind. So the additional rules kind of protect them. They meant no real inconvenience for the nuns in most cases. Uh, if their real goal was practicing towards liberation, then no none of those rules were really in their way. It is just a uh, a decorative set of rules that um, makes cr critic people shut up in a sense. And after no long time, uh, the now nun Gotami attained arahanship just by maintaining her higher virtue, essentially. And yeah, the extra rules were really just a mechanism of protection. It protected both the, the order, the Sangha, and the nuns. Yeah, they were no real hindrance. Again, they mainly protected them from undue criticism. And then we have the establishment of the Patimokkha, which is the rules or the code of conduct for monks and nuns. And there are many, many rules that uh, monks and nuns have to abide by. And again, they are designed to protect the practitioners from their own urges and from their own wrong knowledge. So whenever there was the necessity, the Buddha introduced a new set of rules to protect people. He never introduced a rule without a reason for the introduction of a rule. So he only did it once a problem surfaced, so that there was no uh, redundant rules pretty much that people had to remember. And initially, the Buddha was also very vocal about that fact. He just had to stir people's mindfulness and they would reach liberation just by that. But after a time, it became much more difficult because all the people with perfect conditions and uh, perfect prior training were already liberated. 
So what remained were people with a much more difficult time. And this is much more akin to the population nowadays, where the preconditions are kind of lacking, at least when it comes to virtue, because of our access to sensual engagement, which makes it very hard to shelter ourselves from the pressure of our own feelings. Thus, it is usually very hard for people nowadays to attain stream entry. But it is by no means impossible, and if it is really your goal, then you can get there, which is also something that I really like to, to emphasize. And after 20 years of training or so, the people needed much more instructions. And initially, the reason why the Buddy Mokka was uh, uh, started is that a monk called Zudinda, uh, well, slept with his wife, with his former wife, because she wanted a hair. And the Buddha called him defeated. And uh, when a monk is defeated, it means that he can no longer be a monk. And then he laid out rules against it. Since the rule did not exist at that time, Zudina could stay as a monk, as there was no rule against it at that time. But all the future monks who had engaged in sexual intercourse were called defeated, and they could no longer be monks. They had to continue their practice as lay practitioners. So it is a serious commitment to be a monk, because you can be uh, expelled from the Sangha, and then you have to practice on your own. And most people can't really stomach that. And whenever a serious offense emerged, the Buddha created a new rule against it so that it would not happen again in the future. And thus far, this set of rules, a big set of rules, served people very well. And at each Uposatta, which is the, the different phases of the moon, the distinct cutoff points, <laughs> like full moon, new moon, etc., there is a recital of those rules, at least during the time of the Buddha. And I think in many uh, Buddhist countries it is still a tradition. But anyway, this... Uh, um, finishes the story time for today and we will now continue with an in-depth look at the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path, the most common phrasing of the Buddha's teaching. So whenever you pick up a book about Buddhism, you will likely find some mentioning of the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path or another. And I will continue in that tradition because it is a very nice uh, training scheme, a nice model that you can follow. But again, here is a short reminder uh, of the Four Noble Truths. And first of all, insight happens on the basis of virtue, so please keep that in mind. If you try to understand the Four Noble Truths, you can do that, but if you, if you have still strong craving, you will understand it through your craving, and that is not the understanding that the Buddha was talking about. You will misconceive it, you will misunderstand it. But yeah, the first Noble Truth is that suffering is inseparable from existence as a self as an example. The second noble truth is that suffering depends on things, namely craving, to exist. Suffering has a cause. It is causally arisen. It has a specific cause even. And whenever there is craving, there is also suffering at the same time. The third noble truth is, when what suffering depends upon ceases, suffering also vanishes. And this is essentially a statement that contains the principle of dependent origination. You notice that suffering depends on certain things, and when those causes vanish, suffering will vanish with it. This is the principle of dependent origination, contained in those noble truths. And suffering can only exist at the same time when there is craving present. It's not a temporal principle, it happens at the perfectly same time. It's non-temporal logic. Certain parts in our experience structurally depend on other parts of our experience in a very specific way. And the fourth noble truth is that there is a gradual training leading to the elimination of craving so that it cannot arise again. This is why it is liberation. There is no more need for management of suffering or coping. But yeah, this is a, the true freedom that comes from understanding the four noble truths. This is why the sense of relief and freedom and peace and safety starts with stream entry. <laughs> because then you know what must be done. And we will now try to understand what is necessary to completely remove suffering from your life right now. You don't have to wait for death, you just have to just have to understand those four noble truths. And they are generally understood all at once. You cannot really understand them one by one. Well, in a sense you can. Uh, the Buddha made a distinction between right view and stream entry, uh, strictly speaking, but we will go through that later. For all that matters, the point that is most important is the point of stream entry where there is no turning back and where that feeling of relief sets in. But yeah, let us start just uh, in chronological order with the first noble truth. And the first noble truth is a noble truth of suffering. And again, suffering is likely not what you might think if you have not uh, 
researched Buddhism in detail already. Suffering is a dukkha. Dukkha is a Pali word for suffering, and it is sometimes a good idea just to use the Pali word to avoid the preconceived notions about those very words, because suffering already has a meaning in English, and when we translate it from the original Pali word, namely dukkha, then it has a rather different uh, connotation for most Westerners. And essentially, dukkha is, is the opposite of sukha. Sukha means ease or peacefulness, and dukkha means unease. And it is not just the starvation or battlefield kind of suffering, not just those very intense events that we usually associate with the word suffering. Any kind of stress or any kind of urge to say, change your situation is dukkha. And the Buddha often said, birth is dukkha, decay is dukkha, death is dukkha, and not getting what one wants is dukkha. Or being uh, in the vicinity of things you do not want. This is also dukkha. All those things are suffering. So it is a very big umbrella term for most situations that most people face. So essentially, as long as there is craving and there is no real moment without craving, as long as that is the case, there is also, there is also dukkha present which is very important to keep in mind. So there is basically not a single single moment without some kind of sometimes weak suffering, but there is also suffering present. It is just so subtle that we do not see it. Or let's rephrase it, it is so ever present that we do not recognize it as suffering anymore. Uh, imagine having a chronic pain somewhere in the body. And if it is there long enough, the mind will just shut it out. But when it is gone, some chronic migraine as an example that you didn't even notice anymore, something like that. Then there's a huge moment of relief. And uh, the truth of suffering does not mean that there are no good days. There are good days. There are totally days that are free of suffering and it's not too much of a pessimistic thing. But the possibility to suffer greatly is always there as each of, uh, each of us will die at some point. And that certainty is always there at the back of my mind, of every person's mind. And thus, there's always a possibility to suffer, and the possibility to suffer is already suffering. And feeling of any kind, which is a big insight that people will have if they follow the Buddhist teaching rightly, is always suffering. Feeling is suffering because good feelings will stop. And feelings overall pressure you, as I have already explained. And being forced to do something is not really nice. Imagine someone forces you to eat cake over and over. Well, the first one might be nice, but after a time, but it's not so nice anymore. The simple fact that you are forced to do something already taints it and makes it suffering. So yeah, let us continue. The second noble truth is the truth of the origin of suffering. And this is very important. Suffering has a cause and it has a very specific cause and that very specific cause can be removed. Many things do contribute to, to suffering. And there is a very important thing called or a very important difference between necessary and sufficient conditions. A sufficient condition is something that is, well, just one thing causes another thing. That pretty much means what sufficient conditions are. But there are also necessary conditions. And there can be a, an entire array of like five, 10, 15 things that are necessary that must all be there for, for suffering, as an example, to be there. And when you just remove one of them, then suffering will also vanish. So this is what uh, the causes or the elements in the chain of dependent origination do. Just removing one of the causes of suffering is enough to remove the entire suffering. And that one element that we try to remove is craving. Craving is completely necessary for suffering to be there. And craving is just the immediate wish for things to be different. Craving means wanting things to change for the better. This is what craving is. Craving is, is an umbrella term for greed, hatred, and delusion. Wanting more pleasure, wanting bad feelings to go away, and wanting to not be affected by boredom or by neutral feelings, pretty much. <clears throat> so yeah, and just to, to give you an idea, if we were perfectly fine with things as they are, there could not be any suffering. This is why craving conditions suffering. Just imagine being perfectly fine with dying then there would be no suffering arising on account of it. Because in essence, dying is a natural part of life that we just have to accept. And once we accept it, because we know, okay, there really is nothing that can be done about it, then we can die in peace, as an example. And yeah, hence we do suffer due to craving. And now we come to the third noble truth, which is the truth 
of the cessation of suffering, which again includes the teachings on dependent origination. When one cause ceases, the effect of that cause must cease with it. And yeah, essentially, everything that depends on other things is very fragile. All determined things are fragile in that way, because once a cause is removed, then the following thing is also going to go away. And everything vanish vanishes together with its causes. And this is especially true for simultaneously present things. And simultaneously present things are things like feeling and a mood and thoughts are also there. Your body is also there. All the foundations of mindfulness, as an example, are there at the same time. And it's very important to keep that in mind. Because nowadays there is a myth going around that there is a quick succession of steps happening. Like first there is a feeling, then there is perception, then there is cognition, then there is this, then there is that. But that is not true. The Buddha was always talking about a non-temporal kind of logic. So the Visuddhimagga interpretation of that is not in line with what the Buddha taught. You can still think and ponder that it is right. You can surely do that. But if you want to practice what the Buddha actually taught, then it is a good idea to let go of that wrong view. Those things are there at the same time. In fact, they can't even be there if the other things would not be there at the same time. If you would not have a body right now, then you could not, not have thoughts. It is simply impossible. Those things are there at the same time. And it's impossible to be otherwise. And yeah, when craving vanishes, suffering must vanish with it. And when craving is uprooted, suffering can never regrow. Because when the causes and conditions for craving to arise are gone, then it is impossible for craving, for craving to ever arise again. And this is true right here and now. And you can test it by following the Buddha's teachings. There is no need for an afterlife like in any religion. It is true right here and now and it can be experienced. And when there are people out there who claim that it is not possible, then they are not really following the teachings of the Buddha. And uh, in, a, in a sense, that is a bit sad because many of those people follow what is written in the Visuddhi Magga or in the even older book, the Vimuti Magga, and take it at face value without questioning what is in there. They never made the effort to go to the original teachings, which actually have the capacity to set you free from, from suffering. And uh, thus, they kind of block their own progress towards liberation. And uh, as the Buddha put it, when a, when a person is looking for hardwood and goes to trees, then they take just the sapwood instead of the hardwood and think that they have found hardwood, but they have not. So they have not found the Dhamma yet, and thus they are not free from suffering. Again, which is a bit sad. <clears throat> but anyway, let us continue with the fourth noble truth. And this is the truth of the path leading to the cessation of suffering. And in essence, it states that there is a gradual training to achieve the elimination of craving, which is the Noble Eightfold Path. This is the gradual training. And it ends with complete liberation of mind, the liberation of the chitta aspect of the mind. And the Buddha ex explained liberation as the absence of certain qualities. He said that liberation is a state where there is no longer greed, aversion, and delusion, as an example. And this is maybe the most repeated formulation of the Dhamma. And the following slide that I'm going to present explains the Noble Eightfold Path based on Majjhima Nikaya number 117. And this is also kind of important. The path, the Noble Eightfold Path, should be understood in the sense of a framework. It includes many possible ways to the final goal. What the Buddha said is you just have to avoid certain things and everything else is fine. As long as you do avoid those things that move you away from liberation, then liberation has to be the final result. So in essence, the Buddha taught not one path to the final goal, but all possible paths. So this is another uh, strike of genius that the Buddha uh, displayed when it comes to teaching. He was so skilled at it that he has taught all possible ways to liberation at once. But anyway, let us now continue with the Noble Eightfold Path. And the first element of the Noble Eightfold Path, and this is very important and one of the most misunderstood things out there, is right view. Right view is what enables us to see the Dhamma. We view the Dhamma from then on. The vision of the Dhamma arises for us. 
This is why right view is so important. There is a mundane right view that we discussed in uh, chapter four, but this time it is about the supra mundane right view. And this entire chapter is all about the right view and how to attain it and what is necessary to get there. And again, this is the absolute hard word of the Dhamma, the absolute necessary insight and aspect that you have to have if you want to practice what the Buddha was talking about. Without that insight, there is no Dhamma. You cannot follow the Buddha's teaching without it. So your entire striving, should you desire to be free from suffering, should be directed at attaining the right view. And the right view implies an understanding of the Four Noble Truths. It implies an understanding of dependent origination. Those things are just different ways of phrasing the same thing. And again, the Dhamma begins with right view. It is the first element of the Noble Eightfold Path. And the Buddha always said, right view comes first. That's what he said. And people ignore it all the time. But yeah, it is a moment of great joy and great relief once you attain the right view. And it is worth it, as we have discussed in the first chapter, where we had the simile of the 100 spears that you can look up if you want a vivid description of that. And one of right view knows and sees the Dhamma. He has understood the way out of suffering. And this is the most direct confirmation that you can have, that you cannot suffer from many things anymore. And right view is what makes the other path elements right. The so right, before right concentration as an example, comes from the right view, from the right understanding of the Dhamma. And all the other elements like right livelihood, etc., they are all right because of the right view, which is very, very important to keep in mind. But now to the second element, which is right intention. And now it is important to remember that right intention arises through the right view. Again, it is a necessary precondition. And right intention is very related to kamma and action. Kamma means action or right intention or inclination or upheld inclination or anything like that. And action, right action, is leading to liberation. That is what defines right action. And based on the right view, we can choose things that lead to liberation. Without that, we cannot have the right intention as we do not, ne do not yet know what to do, uh, to do. It would be like gambling, like picking repeatedly the right option, the right actions out of a billion possibilities without knowing what right even is. The chances are so incredibly small that it is basically impossible. And right intention would be or includes intention on renunciation, and intention on non-sensuality, intention on non-ill will, intention of harmlessness or non-cruelty. You abstain from certain things. You avoid doing such actions. And renunciation means that you relinquish, for example, the ownership of the body or other things that you deem yours, that are deeply rooted as mine. But you can only do that based on the right view, on the right understanding of Dhamma, as that is the tool that is necessary to uproot something that is implicit, that you do not know. You do not know where you have self-view. Thus, you must uproot the processes that condition those parts of the self. Let's put it like that, which is again very important. And then we have right speech again. A necessary condition to practice real right speech is the right view. And speech is a very important tool. And the Buddha, suffer, for example, said that people are born with an axe in their mouth, which uh, is referring to the tongue of people with which they can speak. <laughs> and he said it is an axe because we can hurt people with speech very badly. And we should actually make an effort to purify our speech. And we should always speak in accordance with the principle of Dhamma. And lies, as an example, always lead us away from liberation. And uh, this is also very important. People always think that they uh, are beyond virtue uh, from a certain point onwards and that they have not, should not practice it anymore <laughs> as a stream enterer or one of right view or people who believe that they are stream enterers but are not really stream enterers. They always ignore the virtue part of the training and thus they can never really make a breakthrough to the Dhamma, which is again very sad. But yeah, lies always lead you away from liberation because they conflict with the principle of Dhamma. You can only lie with the intention to get something or to avoid something bad for you, which in itself is already something that is against the Dhamma. And it is so important, uh, one of the, uh, the, the right speech aspect is so important that it is part of the five precepts. And in essence, it, it, it includes things like not slandering, not gossiping, no backbiting, no setting one person up against another, and no using harsh or abusive speech. And again, all false speech harms the principle of Dhamma, and all right speech is in accordance with the principle of Dhamma. 
and we can only lie based on a self-view or based on desire. Everything else is completely impossible. And then we have right action. And action, again, is determined or based on intention. Wrong intention, uh, well, upholds wrong action. So when your intention is corrupt or tainted you know, or affected by greed and hatred and delusion, then the only thing that can follow is a wrong action that also has those aspects to it. And right action would be actions that include non-harming, non-cruelty, and non-greed, as an example. And very good direct examples are killing, which is a very wrong action, stealing, which, which is a very wrong action, and sensual misconduct or sexual misconduct, like rape, which is a very, very wrong action. And wrong actions reaffirm the self-view, always. And you can and must practice right action pretty much all the time and thus gradually purify your conduct. And right action is not just bodily action. Action happens in body, speech, and in mind. And people usually ignore the mental part. Speaking yeah, it's a hybrid thing between bodily action and mental action, in a sense. So they can see the action part in it. But mental action like thinking and everything like that, people usually do not associate that with action. But it is included in right action. And thus you should purify your conduct in body, speech and mind, which is very important. And again, you can only really do that based on the right view. Because you know, you only know what is right and wrong with precision once you understood the Dhamma. Uh, one definition of a stream enterer or one who has understood the Dhamma is knowing good as good and bad as bad. Okay, but let us continue. The next element, which is also often attributed to the virtue part of the entire path, is right livelihood. And right livelihood pretty much just means that you should not break any precept, that you should not behave in an unwholesome way. And everyone must, in our modern society as an example, contribute in some way. Otherwise, you would essentially be a parasite. And this is not a good situation to be in. You must offer some value to other people. Otherwise, there's no real reason for you, uh, for them to feed you. There's no, we are not born with a gift card. <laughs> we are not born with the right to be fed by other people, which is a very popular view nowadays. But it is not true from the Buddhist point of view. We must contribute something of value to others in order to receive something. And even monks who own nothing, also contribute greatly to society by teaching other people the good Dhamma. And right livelihood applies especially to killing, to alcohol, to drugs, to stealing, misleading, wrong sexual conduct. And yeah, the Buddha explicitly forbid certain things like trading in weapons, trading in living beings, trading in meat, trading in liquor, trading in poisons. Those things are definitely wrong livelihood. So when you are involved in such a job, and want to practice the Dhamma. Those two, conflict, uh, two things conflict with each other and you should make a great effort to switch your job. You cannot live a contradiction. And you, if you are of right view, then you know that. But chances are that you can't really attain the right view when you are in such a position. So that would already block your, your progress towards the good Dhamma, simply because the actions that you do go so much against the general principle of Dhamma. And then we have right effort. And right effort and energy are closely related. And right effort means going against the grain of the world, which requires effort. Going towards sensuality, going towards instant gratification is always easy. But going against it, that is hard. <laughs> that is freakishly difficult. And the Buddha even said that is the most difficult thing of them all. And a person who practices right effort essentially practices the four right efforts. Namely, he awakens desire and arouses energy and exerts his mind for the non-arising of uh, unwholesome qualities, for the maintaining of freedom from unwholesome qualities, and for he tries to make wholesome qualities arise, and he tries to make sure that wholesome states stay there. And it is an effort to abandon pretty much all wrong parts of the Noble Eightfold Path. And right view, right effort, and right mindfulness circle around each other, as how the Buddha put it in Majjhima Nikaya number 117. And then we have right mindfulness. And this is probably one of the most important aspects of the Noble Eightfold Path, but also one of the most misunderstood ones. But again, mindfulness becomes right based on the right view. Without the right view, you need the instructions of others to guide you in the right direction and make your mindfulness somewhat right, so that you have somewhat right mindfulness for long enough so that you can make the breakthrough to the Dhamma and then verify what right mindfulness is in hindsight. So in hindsight, you can notice, oh, 
I was doing that right. But before that, before that moment where you can check, uh, it is it is very difficult. And mindfulness is there when unwholesome qualities or unwholesome states of mind are not there, or right mindfulness is not there. And craving makes us lose mindfulness. So whenever there is a prospect of sensuality, we give in to that, and then we lose our right mindfulness. And mindfulness is very related to wisdom. And uh, the Buddha often said that one mindfully abandons the wrong path elements. And mindfulness or right mindfulness is essentially the impersonal awareness of things that are going on. It always has a, a connotation of anicca with it. And it's like, for example, when you uh, are mindfully aware of your body, it's like looking at the body like a sack of beans. That's a comparison that the Buddha put out there. And there are four foundations of mindfulness, four anchor points of mindfulness that you can use to uh, analyze your experience. You can, for example, anchor your mindfulness in the body, in your feelings, in your moods or chitta, and in mental objects or thoughts in the broadest sense. And all of those things are simultaneously there. If you think that you do those things one after another, then you do it in a very wrong way. Then that is not true mindfulness. Then you are under the wrong assumption that those things happen, well, temporarily. But no, those things are structurally all there at the same time, as for example explained in Majjhima Nikaya 44, where the Buddhist nun Dhammadina explained those many processes as co-joined as an example, and not as disjoint. They happen at the same time. And you can't have too much mindfulness, which is essentially uh, knowledge of knowledge of the background of experience. And you need sufficient development of mindfulness to discern final knowledge, to make it to full liberation, essentially. And right mindfulness is non-forgetfulness of the three marks, which is, again, very important. And the Buddha compared it with a mother who would not forget about her only child when she cannot be home. So essentially, right mindfulness leads to not forgetting the three marks in whatever you are observing. And you will know when your mindfulness is right. There is a very distinct cutoff point. And then the last element of the path, which is very important that it is the last element, because the path kind of culminates in right samadhi, and the last element thus is right samadhi. And it requires much development, and it culminates in jhana. So there can be a lot of right samadhi that is not yet jhana. And right samadhi would be a state of insight where many path factors come together. And then when they are all there, then it culminates in jhana. And that state, the jhana, is free from any kind of unwholesome. Your body is completely liberated. It's a temporary liberation of mind, as the Buddha put it. And wrong assumptions about external and self cease completely for a time. They can re-arise in the future. But for a time, they are not there. And thus, this is the very reason why all you have to do is dwell in right jhana, which is leading you to liberation, because you are in a liberated state. And when you are in there long enough, it will become the default state of the mind. When you, for example, ask a person why their kind of jhana leads to liberation, they usually fail to answer. They say, yeah, calm is important, but they can't really explain the direct relationship between jhana and, and liberation. But when you interpret it in this way, and we will analyze that in depth in, in chapter 7, then it makes perfect sense why right samadhi or right jhana directly leads to liberation. And you should not confuse it with wrong kinds of jhana, namely with absorption kinds of jhanas, or even the divine kinds of jhanas that I have discussed in other videos. You should not mistake those states, because such a small mistake can block your progress towards liberation. And yeah, we discuss all those uh, fine aspects and fine wrong understandings of jhana in chapter 7. And there are even four additional optional refinements of the four jhanas, namely the jhanas 5 to 8 the immaterial jhanas, as they are often called. But yeah, I think that is pretty much enough for today, as I have been talking for about uh, an hour now. The next part of the lecture concerns itself with insights on the path, where we try to dip our toes into the understanding of the three marks of experience, and we really want to have a good intuition to those things, to find them and recognize them in our experience. But yeah, if you have any remaining questions on all the topics that I have been discussing today, please ask them down below in the comments. And again, please open a new comment for every question so that YouTube informs me about the comments so I can answer them. When you answer to another comment, YouTube will usually not inform me. And uh, this will be a shame because I cannot gather those questions then for the Q&A video at the end. So it would be good if you did that. But yeah. Uh, apart from that, I think we are done for today. 
Thank you very much for watching. If you know anyone who you think would benefit from such a lecture and from such a representation of the Dhamma, feel free to share the video with them. But yeah, until then, I wish you a pleasant day and goodbye, and maybe see you in the next lecture.